joy it is to be together, whether you're here or online. Let's stand to our feet. Let's worship the King this morning. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Hey, Merry Christmas, everybody. Great to be with you again. Miss you guys so much. Great to be with you. Hey, can you guys give it up for all those who are online right now, joining us online? Merry Christmas to all of our brothers and sisters right now online. We love you guys. So glad to have you. In fact, you guys online, you here in the room can help us out. Let people know you're at church today. Go ahead and check in. Just hit your Facebook, what's on your mind, and let them know. You know what? There is a Lord. There is a Savior. He is Jesus Christ, and the world needs to hear it. And you can let the world hear it by checking in right now. And I tell you what, people need prayer, and they're going to probably reach out to you, and 
go, you know what, that's a person of Jesus. And so it's a great way to let people know who your king is and who your Lord is. I also want to encourage you with this, and that is if you have any prayer need whatsoever, you guys in the room, you guys can fill out the cards that are in front of you, the prayer cards, fill those out. You can actually take them to the cross later on in our time together. You can take them out to the giving box. You guys online can actually go to riverchristian.church slash connect, and we will pray over them. Our prayer team, our elders, and our staff will pray over whatever it is. Nothing is too high. Nothing is too low for God. And I want to encourage you to end strong with your generosity. If you're like me, you're like, did I give everything I was supposed to give? And so we're kind of making up on, on opportunities that we missed this past year. And we only have two Sundays, today and then next, next week. And so uh, to make it strong, and I want to ask you to encourage your generosity. Thank you, RCC, for being like God, and that is being an incredible giver. So, hey, I want to ask everybody right now, if you don't mind having a seat, have a seat in the room. We're going to go into a time of communion. And I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, a big thank you. Uh, so many of you guys checked on me, and, and we had people who sent me texts and then sent me more texts and phone calls and Facebook messages and, and um, food and clothes even. You know who you are, the person that brought clothes. Um, uh, I had people in the middle of the night, it was pitch black, and all of a sudden I heard something going on in my backyard, and there was people caroling in my backyard, singing at my window. It's kind of creepy, but I, I appreciate the, uh, the thought. Um, so, so many people were just so loving, and it, it reminded me, even while you're alone in quarantine, how God's people can still serve you, how God's people can still affirm you. And, and I, just, I just want you to know, on, on behalf of my wife and I, and because my family had a quarantine for me while I was being in quarantine, they had a quarantine for everybody else on top of that. On behalf of our family, we just want you to know what an honor it is, a true honor it is to be a pastor at RCC. I mean, this church is so special. It, 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 I, t I talked to Tony, who's in an audiovisual booth, the last Thursday night, this past Thursday night during our worship time, and he just said, you know what, I've never been at a church like RCC. And it's just amazing. This place is unique, and I believe because it's not just about knowing the Word of God, it's about living out the Word of God. And that's what God has always wanted us to do. In fact, when I think about what you have done for me, and what you do for one another, I think about the first Lord's Supper. That time when Jesus first instituted the breaking of the bread, remembrance of him, and, and taking the fruit of the vine, and remembrance of what he did for you and me. Here's something else that he did in the middle of all that. He got down his hands and knees, and he washed the disciples' feet. And here's what he said. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. And that's what RCC does. They continue to live out their faith and praying for one another and serving one another and encouraging one another and, and, and just edifying and having each other's back. You are washing one another's feet. And I just want you to say, I want to say on behalf of my family, thank you so much. Thank you so much for living out what we're about to remember right now, living out the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So as you take this bread and you take this cup, may you be reminded of all the ways that the body of Christ has served you. And maybe during this time, maybe you're reminded, you know what, I ought to encourage someone. Maybe I need to send them a text. There's nothing more godly than in this moment right now, you encouraging, you supporting, maybe send a prayer to someone going, you know what, this Christmas, I know you're in quarantine, I know you're struggling right now, your marriage, but I want you to know you're on my mind, you're in my heart, and you're on my prayers right now. Let's wash, continue to wash one another's feet. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we come before you, and Lord, I just thank you so much for how you've encouraged me through this church family. Lord, in moments when I was kind of lonely, moments when I just felt like life was just passing by, this church family reached out. Lord, I thank you for how they washed my feet, and I thank you for how they washed one another's feet. Lord, I thank you for allowing me to see over and over again Jesus and my brothers and sisters. And Lord, as we take this bread and we take this cup, remembrance of what Jesus has done for us through others, may we right now be inspired to wash someone else's feet. Lord, thank you so much for giving us all, giving us everything giving us your son, giving us the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. And we celebrate that this Christmas by loving and washing one another's feet. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And the whole church said, amen.
He who was before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold Him He who heard humanity's cry Left His throne to wake as a child He became like the least of us Behold Him continue in our worship this morning. Sing with me.
so much for worshiping with us. I want to invite you to have a seat.
Don't you just love Christmas? I mean, it's just amazing. And so one thing I love about Christmas is the opportunity, I think, to think outside of ourselves, to be a blessing to other people. And that's why the Christmas offering is so important. You know, RCC is, I think, a beacon of light in our community. We have many people in our community who come and ask us for help in a trying time in 2020, so much so that our benevolence is emptied out. And so we are using our Christmas offering to refill our benevolence so we can continue to be a beacon of blessing, compassion, and mercy and light to our community and also even those inside of our own church family. And so I want to encourage you to join with me and my wife this, this day. We actually gave our, our Christmas offering and put it in the giving box. We talked about it and said, you know what, let's, let's do what we can and even more than we can. And so that's above and beyond our tithes and offerings. So I encourage you to do that. It's all about giving outside of ourselves and actually 10% of what we get is going to go North Florida Christian Camp who's in need during the season and as well because of COVID. And so we're excited to help them and partner with them in all that they do for Jesus, for a countless number of kids right here in Clay County. You guys online, you actually can give too. You can go to riverchristian.church slash Christmas, and there you can give the Christmas offering. And you in the room, there's giving actually Christmas envelopes there in front of you, and you can put your Christmas offering in there and put a giving box on your way out. Uh, if you're like a planner like me, I love thinking about the future, and I love 2021, and I think about what are we going to preach about. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about, guess what? The Bible. That's right. We're going to be literally in the Bible for the whole year. And if you ever wondered what's it like reading through the whole Bible, well, join us starting January 1st. We're going to start reading through the chronological Bibles. Actually, a guy named Ethelgard Smith, who uh, I studied under, he did a great job of putting the Bible in chronological, chronological order, which I think kind of helps make sense some of the scriptures and how they fit with other parts of the Bible. And we're going to start reading that together January 1st. And if you want to join, us. We actually have Bibles on sale that's out, out actually in the atrium. We have, like on the internet, wiped out all of these Bibles. I think they're all right now on our property, all right? Uh, you guys online, actually, there's a way of, I think you can buy those. You can go to riverchristian.church slash daily Bible. That's just, just in our website with Daily Bible, and you can find that information about the series we're going to start in January. So for the most part in January, we're going to be reading through the Bible together and preaching out of our Bible reading. I love, when I think about Christmas, I love being able to tell people about Christmas. I love sharing stories about Christmas. And I think that's just kind of how we're, we're been. I think God has given us something inside of our DNA. When we get excited about something, we want to share it, don't we? I mean, have you ever hung out with somebody that lost 10 pounds? They can't shut up, right? I mean, they just want to talk about it all the time. Hey, I got this new diet. You got to know. Let me tell you about my diet, my diet, my diet, my diet. And you're like, I hear what you're saying. That's so wonderful. I mean, that's just kind of who, who we are. We love to tell people about, you know, what's going well in our life and good things we're experiencing. And I, I think about one of the first times that happened to me was I actually wrecked um, my truck that my parents got for me. And my grandfather bought me a 1987 Buick Cutlass. And I tell you what, I was so excited. My grandfather told me it was a chick magnet, and so I was really excited to, to drive it around, you know, my senior year in high school. And I told people, hey, I'm back on the road again. And, and you know, even though I only got five miles per gallon, I was so happy to have that 1987, you know, Buick Cutlass. I think about as time goes on, you get married, you're telling people about, oh, I, you know, I found somebody, and then, and, then, and then you get married, and then you have your first kid, and you want to, you know, you're excited about telling people about it. When they come out, you're not so sure because they come out all pruned like a raisin. You're like, I don't know if I want anybody to know about this. But then you clean them up, and then they look like this. This is my first child, Cameron, and, and, and I tell you what, it's amazing. We want to share photos, don't we? I mean, nobody's worse than this than grandparents, right? I mean, grandparents love to show photos on their cell phone of their grandkids. And, and I, I could talk more and more about this. I think about videos. I probably get sent videos from people at RCC multiple times per day. And I'm just going to say right now, I can't watch all those videos, 
all right? Because apparently my wife wants me to spend some time with her at some point, so I can't watch all your videos. But we love doing that. I got this video. I need the pastor to watch it. You know, they need to see this video. And it, that's kind of what we do. It's called going viral, which is unfortunate in 2020 you call something going viral. But it's like that. It's like a virus. We just spread it. We just love showing funny or meaningful videos to one another. It's like we can't stop. We're that way. We get excited about something. We just want to talk about it, right? Right? We just want to tell other people about it. We, 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 we're, we're good news tellers is what we are. We are spread the word kind of people, aren't we? There's a challenge actually in scripture about the time when Jesus was born to some people of all people. Their challenge was spreading the word. They're called the shepherds. And look what it says right here in scripture. It says when they, the shepherds, had seen him, Jesus, they what? They spread the word. They had been shepherds, but now they're on a mission. They had been shepherds, but now they have a message. They were going to be life changers. And I'm going to talk to everyone who's a part of our church for this Christmas. And that is, we have a challenge in front of us this Christmas, this week, to spread the word about Jesus. And I want to talk about why that matters so much and to how God invites us and why God invites us to be a part of it. Here's what the story says in Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days they, that they were, went out a decree. There went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all, look at this, all the world should be taxed. And, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. So that led Joseph. Joseph then also had a, went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was, he was of the house and lineage of David. So I want to talk today about a contrast between, you know, good news we like to share and then real good news. The story begins with Caesar Augustus. He makes a decree that all the world should be taxed. And there's a, that's a pretty amazing big thing when you think about it. I mean, one guy is able to decree that everyone ought to pay money to him. I mean, it's like, why? Caesar knew he was the guy with the power. He knew that he was the guy, he believed this about himself. He was the guy that was good news for the whole world. As a matter of fact, an ancient scripture says this, Caesar Augustus is what? He is savior. He's a savior of the world. The language savior of the world is a very potent, loaded language. Caesar claimed that title for himself. He is saying this, he is the good news. He is the gospel. It's called euangelion, which is a Greek word. It's a loaded word saying, you know what? I'm the savior. I'm the good news. I'm the gospel of, for, the, for the entire human race. Another inscription from ancient times said this about Caesar Augustus. The birthday, all right, the birthday of the God. Who's the God? Caesar Augustus. He claimed to be divine, has marked the beginning of the what? The good news, gospel, loaded language there for the world. It's kind of an odd thing. The birthday of Jesus, the birthday of actually Caesar was regarded as the beginning of the gospel. The birthday of Caesar Augustus. Hey, does anyone know Caesar Augustus' birthday? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Anyone? No, nobody, right? It was September 23rd. You messed it, by the way. Hey, did anybody buy birthday cards for Caesar Augustus and hand them out to somebody else this past September? No. But there's another birthday that's going pretty strong right now. Wouldn't you agree? Would it come as a surprise to Caesar Augustus? Caesar had all the money. He had all the clout. Caesar had all the power. And he believed his reign was good news for the whole world. He believed that his reign was going to bring peace on earth. He believed his reign was going to bring prosperity on earth. Any reader in the ancient world that is reading this would thought, oh, obviously Caesar, he's the good news. But as you start reading Luke, you're realizing he's not talking about Caesar. He's talking about somebody else. So an ancient person would have thought to himself, well, if Caesar's not calling the shots, who is? I mean, who's the one that's making the decisions here? Who's in charge? Who really is good news? So the story of Christmas leads Joseph. And I think about Christmas, I think about Joseph's journey, and that is his journey home. And Christmas is a lot like that, right? Christmas is about going home. 
And we don't know about Joseph's home. We don't know what he had in Bethlehem. We don't know if he had any property there. We don't know if he had any family there. We just know that he had to go to a little town called Bethlehem. And it's really interesting. In Hebrew, Bethlehem means house of bread. One would be born out of Bethlehem, Jesus, and he would say, I am the bread of life. If you're hungry, the core of your soul, you come to me. And when I think about Christmas and I think about home, there's one place I can't get out of my mind, and that's my grandparents' house in Norcross, Georgia. I mean, I remember going in the house during Christmas time and, and smelling bread. Is there anything better than smelling bread, baked bread, when you come into a house? And I'm not talking about just regular bread. I'm talking about my grandma's bread, which was banana bread. Is there anything better than baked banana bread when you come into the house? I mean, I'm not talking about just banana bread. I'm talking about fabulous bread with walnuts. The, gay, the, 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 the way that God intended banana bread to be made, right? With, with, with a half an inch of butter on top and let that just kind of work itself in the warm bread. My grandmother also every Christmas would make red velvet cake. All right, I'm talking like it was just deep red on the outside with this white glaze and on top were these red sprinkles. Am I making you hungry? All right. I mean, it's just nothing better than red velvet cake and smelling all those smells. I love the smell of the pantry, my grandparents' house. I love the way that she decorated the Christmas tree, huge ornaments. And I think about all the gifts that I received in that house during Christmas time. I remember being a kid and receiving a cassette tape from James Taylor, the album called Gorilla. I'm not sure why Santa Claus thought I needed James Taylor, but I listened to that quite often that Christmas, and I think about all the joy that I had in that place. I don't know about you, I moved around a lot, so that was one of the few places that didn't change very much. And so when I think about home, I don't know what you think about, but I think about going home, I think about that house in Norcross, Georgia. It's kind of an odd thing, you know, we think about home for Christmas, because it can bring so much joy to you. It can bring where memories of being loved as you were growing up. Many years ago, my other grandfather was away for Christmas along with a whole bunch of other guys because they were fighting a war in World War II in Europe and out in Asia. And during that time, a song became popular on the airways, and it says this main lyric in the song, I'll be home for Christmas. It's a moving fr phrase, isn't it? I'll be home for Christmas. It may fill you with lots of memories of gratitude or it may fill you with pain. Maybe your home is like a Looney Tunes factory. I, I don't know. And it brings painful thoughts to you. And we're all longing, you know, for home. And some of us long for a home that will be better for the next generation than what we have. So the funny thing about home, home can create more joy than anything else. And home can create more pain than anything else. Home is actually quite a hard word to define. It's not just somewhere you live, right? It's not just a place that houses your body. It's a place where you're supposed to belong. It's a place where you're supposed to be safe. It's a, it's a place where your love is supposed to prevail. But oftentimes we think about home, we realize that oftentimes it isn't safe. And sometimes we feel excluded. And sometimes love doesn't always prevail. And it turns out that our longing for home, our home sickness... It's something this world cannot satisfy. You and I and everybody else was made for a deeper home. And Jesus came and he talked about this. And here's what he said in John 14. I will not. Look at that word. I will not. And I just want to say when Jesus makes a promise, he always backs it up. I will not leave you as orphans. Whoever loves me will obey my commandments. My Father will love them, and we will come to them. Look at this amazing promise here. And make our what? And make our home in them. You were meant, amazingly enough, to be in the place God calls home. And God wants for you to be at home in him, and God wants to be at home in you. And the invitation stands for the entire human race. Jesus put it this way. He said, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone comes and anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus would tell stories that humans could understand about coming home. You're invited back home. The prodigal son story, this young man looks at his dad and basically says, I wish you were dead. 
He wounds his father. He goes ahead, his dad gives him the inheritance that he should only get after he's been, he's obviously passed. And he goes off in a far distant land and he blows all of his inheritance. And at the bottom of the barrel, when this prodigal son is in enormous pain, he wakes up, the Bible says he came to his senses. And he wakes up and realizes, you know what, being a servant at home is better than what I've got going on right now. I wonder if they'll receive me back. What he doesn't know is that his dad is waiting for him with outstretched arms. And Jesus says, this is the heart of your dad. This is the heart of your heavenly father. Whoever you are, wherever you've been, whatever you've done, just come back home. Just come home. And the invitation is for every single one of us. And if you know Jesus, if you made your home through him with God, is to tell people. We are commanded to spread the word. Well, you're like, about what? Well, this, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus the Savior is born. And Anyone, I mean, anyone who wants to can be home with God. And I know what happens when someone says, hey, spread the word. You're immediately kind of starting getting pushed back, you know, pushed back. You start coming up with excuses. You start going, yeah, I don't know how to do that. I mean, I haven't been trained. I mean, I'm not articulate enough about my faith. I'm not sure what I ought to say about it. I don't, I don't feel adequate. We start giving pushback. And, and I just want you to hear me. That's why we're talking about the shepherds. That's why we're talking about the shepherds today. The shepherds were the first guys to spread the word. Now, we tend to think shepherds like in sentimental terms. We tend to think of shepherds as, you know, nice guys. People, you know, thought highly of them. Uh, There would be great guys to have at, you know, your Christmas dinner, you know. We tend to think that way. But in Jesus' day, that's not the case. In Jesus' day, they were looked down upon. In Jesus' day, there were certain occupations in Israel that were called despised occupations. Like, mamas don't want their babies to grow up to be fill in the blank. You know, and, and, and let me give you some examples. Despised occupations actually came from Jewish writings. One of them is gamblers with dice. I think for obvious reasons. Usurers, you're like, what's a usurer? That is somebody who takes advantage of the poor. Here's the interesting one, uh, strange. Uh, pigeon trainers. Don't be a pigeon trainer. What, what was, what's up with that? Because pigeon training was often associated with gambling, so that's not a good thing. How about Sabbath violating farmers? That's not a good uh, trade as well. And then we have shepherds. Shepherds. Shepherds were looked down upon so much, it was just assumed that shepherds were thieves and dishonest. Shepherds would oftentimes take their flock and graze on somebody else's property. Sometimes shepherds would actually go in and take, if, if take your best sheep out to make their flock even better. Shepherds were considered to be dishonest and thieving people. You know, in our day, we make fun of certain occupations. Well, in their day, they made fun of shepherds. So much so, I mean, it was like a disdain. Look what, look what ancient Jewish writing says about shepherds. There is not a more disreputable occupation than that of a what? Of a shepherd. Shepherds were looked down so much so that they couldn't even bear witness in the court of law. Literally, if you were accused of a crime, okay, and your only alibi was you're out playing poker with three other shepherds, you were toast. I mean, they couldn't even bear witness in the court of law. They weren't allowed even to enter the court. And yet, hear me, it's the shepherds that God chose to be the very first ones to bear witness to the birth of Jesus. Why? Here's why. If shepherds can be witnesses for Jesus, guess what? Anybody can be a witness for Jesus. Because it's not about your credibility. It's not about how articulate you are. It's all about the person. And his name is Jesus. And it's about spreading the word about Jesus. It's not about you. It's all about him. But we do it. We spread the word all the time about stuff. With the goofiest things. Uh, Somebody sent me this meme the other day. You know, about a koala. I have the necessary qualifications. Like, you know, we, we love sharing memes about things. And sharing weird stuff about chocolate and about cars. But why wouldn't we do it with what? matters most one night when the shepherds out in the field an angel appears and the shepherds are overwhelmed it says with fear and with joy 
And it says, the angel said to the shepherds, do not be what? Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. That's the word. That's the gospel. See, it's not just good news for some folks. It's not just good news for the powerful like Caesar and those who have money. This is good news for anybody that will cause great joy for how many people? For all the people. It doesn't matter who you are. All the people today in the town of David, the Savior has been born to who? To you. Yeah, you shepherds. You guys, lowest of the low. Man, I'm telling you right now, even to you, shepherds, he is the Messiah. He is the Lord. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Savior of the world. It's not Caesar. Caesar is not Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen, church? I was thinking about people who have power. Names came to my mind, like Warren Buffett. Does Warren Buffett have power? Absolutely. Warren Buffett says something. It changes markets. But here's the thing about Warren Buffett. He's not Jesus. He can't save anybody. How about Oprah? Does Oprah have power? She has unbelievable power. She can make careers. She makes Dr. Oz, Dr. Phil, Gail, you know, whoever it is. She puts a book out, becomes a bestseller immediately. She bought 10% of Weight Watchers, and their stock went up immediately 105%. Does Oprah have power? She's got amazing power. But she's not Jesus. She can't save anybody. How about Taylor Swift? Does Taylor Swift have power? She's got unbelievable power. I mean, if you date Taylor Swift and break up with her, she'll write a song about you, and the whole world will know what kind of scumbag you are, all right? (laughs) Unbelievable power Taylor Swift has. But she's not Jesus. She can't save anybody because there's only one name in heaven and on earth in which you and I can be saved. I'll tell you about the power of Jesus, what it can do. Only Jesus can answer your prayer. Only Jesus died on the cross for you. Only Jesus can forgive your sin. Only Jesus was resurrected from the grave. Only Jesus can give you purpose in this life. Only Jesus can give you hope beyond your death. Only Jesus was born in a manger and died on the cross and then resurrected three days later. And 2,000 years, he has been changing lives. Only Jesus can do that. Amen, church? The word came to the shepherds, it says. And the shepherds say, the sh- they say, they say, they're told, you've got to tell the people. Look what happened. When they, the shepherds, had seen him, Jesus, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And look at this. Amazing. Amazing. Supernaturally. Here's what happened. And all who heard it were what? Amazed. At what the shepherds said to them. Notice then, again, these shepherds, there's all kinds of people that could have been chosen, but the shepherds are the ones chosen. They shouldn't be doing this, but they are the ones commanded by God to do it. I can imagine people going, you're not even educated. He's like, I know, but Jesus, I mean, you can't even testify in the court of law. I know. But Jesus, there's no reason why on earth I should be listening to you bunch of thieving, dirty, nasty. I know. But Jesus. And when they spread the word, all who heard it were amazed. Now in today's time, it's not the shepherds. Guess who it is now? It's you. It's me. It's us. And I'm asking because this is the part of the mission of our church. We get it from the Great Commission in Matthew. And that is we are to spread the word. We are to win people to Jesus Christ. This is our church. This is our day. This is where we live. And the question before you this Christmas is, will you spread the word? Christmas Eve is this Thursday, and one thing about Christmas Eve is that if there's any time of year that people are open to coming to church, now more than ever, it is Christmas Eve. People love to come to Christmas Eve services. They just, they love it. And I just had this gnawing conviction about this Christmas Eve. I don't want Christmas Eve just to be another warm, fuzzy religious experience for folks. I'm praying about this. This year, Christmas Eve is going to be a great service. We're working really hard on it. And I'm going to give the clearest invitation I know how to give to tell people about Jesus and invite them to give their lives to Jesus. And I want to give you this challenge. And oftentimes, I discourage this 
But I want to give you this challenge. A lot of times when I preach, people come up and say, man, I know someone who needs to hear that. Man, I, I, got, I got to send that off to, you know, my relative in Missouri or whatever. That's oftentimes what I hear. And I, and I just want to be honest. While I'm talking about stubbornness, I'm not talking about your crazy relative. I'm talking about you, all right? And I'm talking about whatever it is, like lust. You're the lusty guy I'm talking about, all right? But here's the thing I want you to think about this Christmas Eve. I don't want anyone here thinking, man, I wish so-and-so was here to hear this sermon. We want to be the very best we can and create a service where people can interact with Jesus and invite them to say, you need to know this Jesus. You need to give your life to this Jesus. And we're going to give an invitation for all people, for all of us to spread the word. And so this Christmas Eve, I'm asking you, will you come and invite your neighbor, your coworker, your family member, your friend, people you don't even like, and invite them to Christmas Eve, all right? We're going to have four options for you. We have a 1.30, we have a 3 o'clock, we have a 4.30, and we we have a six o'clock. We got four options for you, and we're going to ask you if you don't mind, come to either the one thirty, the three, or the six o'clock because we're trying to create as much room as we can, especially during COVID, for people so they can come in and feel really comfortable this Christmas Eve. Even you guys online, you can invite people to come to your house and watch Christmas Eve with you. We're going to have online at four thirty and at six o'clock. So we're going to have those two options online. You just watch it the same way you're watching the service right now. And so we're encouraging you to invite people this Christmas. And you're like, well, who do I invite? There's a million options here in Jacksonville, all right? And every one of those people is somebody's son and somebody's daughter. Every one of them God is crazy about. We have a million people in our city, and most of them have no community of faith. They don't know God. And I want to say that this week, as clearly as I know how to say it, there is a who. There's a who. There is somebody in your life God wants to reach through you. There's somebody in your life that God wants to reach through you. And, and, and I'm telling you right now, that is why every person is made for eternity. We will face an eternity either in heaven or in hell. And that fact remains. The Bible says that God has placed eternity into the hearts of every man and of every woman. Death is not the end of us. Every human being is going to face death and an eternity. Either an eternity of joy together with God or unbelievable pain being excluded from the presence of God based on their choice. Here's the thing. Jesus is still in the life-changing, life-saving business. And he'll do it, and he'll work through you just like he did the shepherds. He does it all the time. And I think there's a temptation we have to kind of do what we do in here in this church and, and come online and watch this and be spiritual, but then we operate differently when we leave the confines of church. It's called operating in two spheres. In fact, Hitler jumped on this teaching in 1930s, when he went to the pastors, and here's what he said. He said, you guys, you guys, you know, Jesus is Lord within the church confines. But once that's out, once you leave those confines, how about this? I'll take care of the people. Kaiser will take care of the people. And, and what, a couple of pastors, in fact, one of them was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who died for it. He said, you know what? That's not for you to make that decision. It's our responsibility. You cannot take that God-given obligation away from us. us. You, Hitler, nor any other power on this planet. Sadly, though, most of German pastors went the way that Hitler suggested. And because of that, the world was devastated. An eyewitness account of a believer living in Germany during this time of being taught about living in these two spheres, you know, that Jesus is Lord of the church and that Hitler is Lord of the empire, he said this, I believed I lived in Germany during the Holocaust and I considered myself a Christian. We heard stories about what was happening with the Jews, but we tried to distance ourselves from it because what could we do to stop it? A railroad track ran right by our church and every single Sunday morning we heard the whistle as it went by. And we became disturbed as we heard the cries coming from the train as it passed through. And we realized it was carrying Jews like cattle. Week after week, Sunday after Sunday, the whistle would blow, and we dreaded hearing the sound of that train coming because we knew we would hear the cries of the Jews en route to the death camp. The screams, their screams tormented us in church, and we heard their whistle blow. We began to sing hymns. 
And by the time the train came to pass our church, we were singing at the top of our voices. And if we heard the screams, we sang more loudly, and soon we heard them no more. And all those, he said this, years have passed. I can still hear the train whistle in my sleep. And when I read that account, I heard that account from Germany, I couldn't help but think, you know what, we're often facing the same challenge today. I believe that far too many Christians are too quite comfortable with living in the doctrine of two spheres. And what I mean by that is we're quite comfortable saying Jesus is Lord of some of my life, but Jesus is not Lord of all of my life. We're quite comfortable being open with our faith in the confines of these church walls where Jesus is Lord rather than outside these walls where all of a sudden we start worshiping and bowing down to other lords. In the meantime, there are people all around us in our neighborhood and in our schools and in our own families, in our own friendships that we have. People all around us are on the path to destruction. And the question I have for you This Christmas, are you going to settle for singing louder within the church walls, or are you going to do something that transcends singing louder this Christmas? Are you going to seek to move Jesus more in the center of your conversations that you have with those in the spheres of your influence and of your relationships? Because they have so much more to gain than we have to lose. And Jesus, I'm telling you, church, he is still changing lives. He's still doing it, and we get to be a part of it. And so my question to you this Christmas is this. Will you be a life changer? Will you be a life changer? Will you pray right now and ask God, God, would you help me be more bold? God, would you bring people in my mind that I should be reaching out to this Christmas? And if my heart has been cold, if my heart has been hard this Christmas, Lord, would you make it more tender? Would you make it more warm? Would you help me when I'm with people to think, maybe right now I should plant a seed. Maybe uh, the car that's in front of you, you got a card around you, grab that card. Maybe you're on, you know what, I want to hand this to the, the person at the gas station. I want to hand this to my neighbor across the street. I want to invite my grandchildren this Christmas Eve. What Right now, who is it that's coming to mind? Who is it right now that God's saying, you know what, why don't you take a little risk with this person? Won't you get a little more bold, a little more courageous with this person right now? Won't you take an opportunity to plant a seed in this person right now to spread the word and tell the only real good news about Jesus? That is why you have breath in your lungs right now, is to spread the word. You're created, you're designed to be good news tellers. You do it all the time. Right now, this Christmas, why don't we do it about what matters most? As I was talking right now, maybe a mind, a name came to your mind. Maybe somebody came up right now that you've been praying for. We've been challenging ourselves from the very beginning of this year. Who's your one? Who's that person right now you can reach out to and invite this Christmas Eve? Either here in person or even at your house to watch the Christmas Eve service online. Who, who is that person right now that God's saying, you know what? This is the name that's on your heart. Maybe you don't know, you say, God, on your response card, you can put right now, God, reveal that person to me. Maybe right now on your response card that's in front of you, and you guys online, you can go to riverchristian.church slash connect, you can put that person's name down and take them to the cross. Maybe this Christmas you're like, you know what, I need more joy this Christmas. I I need joy to manifest itself more with my family and relationships around me this Christmas. Maybe you need a prayer. Maybe right now your heart's gotten too hard, your heart's gotten too cold. God, I need you to warm my heart. I need you to make my heart more tender for those who are lost around me. God, I need more faith. I need more trust in you this Christmas. I don't know what it is, but right now, once you fill out that response card, as we sing a song in a second, you can take your response to the cross on your right or on your left. But right now, I'm going to ask you, respond with that name, and we'll lift up that name to the throne of God. And God, I'm telling you right now, God always answers prayer. Will you stand with me? Right now, let's just go to God in prayer. And while I'm praying, maybe a name comes to your mind. You just write it down on that response card. And whatever other prayer need comes to mind, just go ahead and write it down on the response card. And then take it to the crosses during this time of worship. Let's go to God in prayer right now. Father God, we come before you, and I want to ask for me... And I want to ask for everybody who's a follower of you 
Would you help us to remember again? Would you help us to be undone? To be overwhelmed again with the matchless person of Jesus. And the life-changing offer of his gospel that leads us from death to life. Heavenly Father, we pray right now for those in our lives, for some of us, God, that name, that face will come up real fast. That son or that daughter, that brother, that sister, that person at work, that person at the restaurant, the store, who we know and love. God, will you work? Will you be at work in them right now? Would you be at work all over the world for people who are lost from you this Christmas? Would you bless every church, every ministry? And God, we pray right now for our church. For every follower of Jesus, God, could, could what happened once through the shepherds happen through each and every one of us? We believe it could. God, we just need to be lit up inside by your spirit. Help us to spread the word so that many, many will find Jesus as their Savior and come home. And Lord, we lift up these names to you. We lift up our own prayers to you right now. And Lord, may you work in a mighty way and convict us to share the real good news about Jesus, the Savior, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who was born. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And the whole church said, amen. So anything you need right now, if you want to respond to the cross, once you head that way as we worship the only one who deserves our worship, Jesus Christ, the Lord.
I tell you what, it's amazing. I love Christmas. I love the music, and I love being with you. I'm so glad to be back, and uh, I'm so glad that all those who joined us online today as well. We want to say a Merry Christmas to you, and we love you guys wherever you are. Hey, I want to encourage you with this during the Christmas season, and that is give, and we're asking Toys for Tots. If you, if you have not brought those toys you plan to, go ahead and bring them today, and you can put them in the atrium, and uh, those, those, all those toys are going to the, those in need in our community, those kids in need. And so I just want to say a big thank you on behalf of all those families for those who brought toys. Also, don't forget the Christmas Light Spectacular. If you have not watched this and not been on our property between 6 and 8.30, you're messing out, all right? It's COVID-friendly. It spreads the word about Jesus Christ. So get your family here. Get other people in your neighborhood in your car. Bring them over here and watch that 15-minute presentation. I tell you what, it is phenomenal. It's going to go, once again, every night all the way till New Year's Eve, December 31st. And don't forget... I'm excited about Christmas Eve. You guys excited about Christmas Eve services here on, on campus and online? We got a 1.30, we got a 3, we got a 4.30, we got a 6, and we're asking all of you to help us create room by going to any of the other services besides 4.30. If you have to come to 4.30, come on. But we're asking you, if you're able to, able to go on those other services, please help us out. And also, uh, those online can join us at the 4.30 or the 6 o'clock Christmas Eve service. We'd love to see you there as well. I want to wrap up just with a blessing over you this Christmas. This is my Christmas blessing to you and your family, and here it is. May you in your home this Christmas celebrate the birth and the life of Jesus. And may each of us be filled with wonder with Jesus who is called the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, and the prince of peace. And may your family be consumed by a spirit of gratitude and joy that comes through Jesus and may it manifest most in how you love one another. Can we celebrate Jesus together one last time before Christmas Eve? Awesome having you online. God bless RCC and Merry Christmas. We'll see you soon.